Okay, hello again. This is chapter 3, and in chapter 3 we're talking about elements, compounds, and mixtures. So, what is an element, what's a compound, and what's a mixture? You should know that an element is a substance that contains only one type of atom, or one, uh, uh, sorry, or identical atoms, but don't say it is one atom. Okay, it's not one atom, it's one type. So if I have an element, you have many atoms, but all of them are the same. So you can say it's a substance that contains identical atoms or one type of atom, but don't say one atom. Okay, what about a compound? What's a compound? A compound is made up of two or more elements chemically combined together in a fixed ratio. So you have each of these is a molecule of a compound. The compound, each molecule is made up of different elements. So this is two or more elements. And these elements are chemically combined together. Don't use the word combined in any of the other definitions. So a compound, the elements are combined together. And they're combined together in a fixed ratio. So if I'm saying sodium chloride, sodium chloride, each molecule has one atom of sodium, one atom of chlorine. Water, for example, H2O, has two atoms of hydrogen attached to one atom of oxygen. The other one here is sodium carbonate. Sodium carbonate is made up of two atoms of sodium attached to one atom of carbon attached to three atoms of oxygen. So this is made up of two or more elements. They are chemically combined together and they have a fixed ratio. You cannot put them anywhere you like. Now, what about a mixture? A mixture is two or more substances added together. Never say combined because if you say combined, that's wrong. Combined applies to compound only. A mixture is made up of two or more substances. This is because there could be two elements or there could be two compounds. So two or more substances added together and can be separated by simple physical processes. If the word simple physical processes is too much, you can just say can be separated easily or can be separated by simple methods, for example. So that is a mixture. So a mixture is made up of two or more substances, so they could be elements or compounds, added together and can be separated easily or by simple methods. Okay, solution is an example of a mixture. A solution is made up of two things, something dissolved in something else. Now, what I'm trying to dissolve from my spoon into the water there is called a solute. So, the solute is the substance that dissolves. Now, I'm dissolving it in what? In water, then water is my solvent. So, solvent is the substance in which the solute is dissolved. So, solution is a mixture of solute dissolved in solvent. Which one is the solute? If, well, if you're putting something like sugar into water, sugar is your solute and the water is the solvent. Now, if I say what is a pure substance, a pure substance is something that contains no impurities. Or I could say that it is a substance, made, it is made up of only one substance. So, you don't have two or more things. Remember that a pure substance could either be an element or a compound. So if I say that I have only hydrogen, only sodium, only chlorine, then this is a pure substance. But if I have sodium chloride with something else, for example, then this will contain impurities. Okay. So a pure so solid, how do I know if something is pure? If I give you sodium chloride, for example, Sodium chloride is a solid. Sodium chloride is actually what we call at home salt. So the salt that we add to our food is sodium chloride. Now, if I give you a, uh, some sodium chloride, how would you know if this is a pure so, uh, solid or not? If it is pure, it should have a fixed, sharp melting point. So I take the solid and I measure its melting point. If it melts at a specific melting point, then it is pure. If it is not pure, it will not melt at a specific melting point. It will melt at a lower melting point. So something that is not pure will melt at a lower melting point than what it should be. 
What if I have a liquid? How do I know if the liquid is pure? I measure its boiling point. If it has a fixed, sharp boiling point, then um, it is pure. What if it is not pure? Its boiling point will be slightly higher. So remember, the melting point, if the substance is impure, the melting point is slightly lower. Uh, boiling point, the boiling point of something that is not pure will be slightly higher. Okay, so presence of impurities in a solid will cause it to melt at a lower melting point and over a range of temperatures it will not have a fixed sharp melting point it will melt over a range so for example what is the melting point of ice you should know that the melting point of ice is zero degrees centigrade what if i have ice and i mix with it a little bit of salt so in countries where they have a lot of snow if they want to um, cause the snow to melt at a lower temperature or the ice to melt at a lower temperature, they add a little bit of salt. So when I add a little bit of salt, what happens to the melting point? Instead of melting at zero, it will melt at minus one, minus two, minus three, and it will melt over a range of temperatures. So not at a specific temperature, it will all melt. No, it will melt over a range of temperatures. When we're talking about a liquid, we said presence of impurities causes the liquid to what? to boil at a higher boiling point over a range of temperatures. So if the boiling point is slightly higher than what it should be, then I have impurities. For example, what is the boiling point of pure water? Boiling point of pure water is 100 degrees centigrade. What if I dissolve something in my water and I try to boil it? Then it will boil at what? At something like 100 on 1, 102, 103 not very much higher notice that it is slightly lower or slightly higher not very much higher or very much lower so if it's supposed to boil at 100 if it has impurities it will probably boil at 102 103 and so on and over a range of temperatures and the purity of a substance is very important we need substances to be pure for what for for example our food we need our food to be pure Drugs, and here please remember that the word drugs here means the medicine that you take when you're sick or something, not something else. Okay, so drugs in science or in chemistry is used to refer to the um, medicine that we take when we're sick. Okay, these drugs have to be pure. Drinking water has to be pure. I don't want uh, a lot of impurities in the drinking water. Okay, so let's try, this is a typical question that you could have. What is always true for a pure substance? What is always true for a pure substance? Any pure substance. Let's see the choices. It always boils at 100 for any pure substance. Is that correct? Because actually some people think, or sorry, some students think that when I say boiling, then it's 100. It's boiling is 100 if we're talking about water, but we could be talking about anything else. So a pure substance, if I say it always boils at 100 degrees centigrade, that's definitely wrong, because this will apply only to pure water, not any pure substance. Okay, what about choice B? It contains only one type of atom. What was that? This was a definition for what? It contains only one type of atom? This was definition for element, not pure substance. And remember that a pure substance can either be an element or a compound. So I can say that I have pure uh, sodium, for example, or pure hydrogen, or pure whatever. But I can also say pure sodium chloride, pure potassium carbonate, and so on. So saying that it's only one type of atom, that's not right. That applies only to elements, and a pure substance can either be an element or a compound. It has a sharp melting point. Is that correct? Yes. If it's pure, it should have a sharp melting point. So this should be my answer. Well, let's check D and make sure that it is wrong. D says it's a solid at room temperature. Do all pure substances have to be a solid? No. So my answer is C. That is correct. Any pure substance should have a sharp melting point. Okay, this was the other question. A gas has the molecular formula NOCl. Of 
course, you know that N is nitrogen, ox O is oxygen, and Cl is chlorine. So this is an atom of uh, nitrogen attached to an atom of oxygen attached to an atom of chlorine. And he's saying which diagram could show molecules of the pure gas and OCl. Okay, pure gas of NOCl means I want NOCl only. And then he said that the NOCl is a compound together. So my N should be attached to my O, should be attached to my Cl. So A is definitely wrong. Do you understand that? In A, the N is alone, the Cl is alone, the oxygen, these are elements. And it's a mixture of elements. So this is not my pure NOCl. Now, what about B? In B, all the molecules are the same. And I have one molecule of oxygen and one molecule of chlorine and one molecule of nitrogen. So this is probably my answer. Let's check the others to see if the others are wrong. So C has different types of molecules. So this is definitely not pure anyway. So C is wrong. And D has the different atoms arranged in different ways. Now, if you arrange the atoms in different ways in a molecule then you have actually different uh, substances so my answer is B do we understand that okay to separate mixtures the easiest method to separate a mixture would be filtration to f using filtration we are trying to separate something that is insoluble from a liquid so I have a liquid like water or solution or whatever and I have something floating inside it an insoluble solid this is the method that you use to separate an insoluble solid from the solution. You put it through a filter paper that is inside a funnel and the solution or the liquid will go down into the flask. Now anything that goes down into the flask is called the filtrate and the insoluble solid will remain in the filter paper and we call it the residue. So whatever is in the filter paper is the residue, whatever goes down into the flask is the filtrate. Okay, now this is an example of an investigation that you could be asked about in paper six. Remember that in paper six, he asks you to design experiments, to plan an investigation. So what are we doing here? He says beach sand is a mixture of sand and broken shells made of calcium carbonate. So the shells are made of calcium carbonate. So when he talks about beach sand, it's actually sand with calcium carbonate. Calcium carbonate reacts with dilute hydrochloric acid to form a solution of calcium chloride. That means that if you have calcium carbonate as a solid, it will dissolve in the hydrochloric acid and form calcium chloride. Plan an investigation to find out the percentage of shell material in a given sample of beach sand. Okay, let's think together. When you have this kind of question, it's a good idea to think for a few minutes, decide what you're going to do, and then you start to write. So he has a mixture of sand and shells, and he says the shells are calcium coordinates. So basically we have sand and calcium coordinates. And we're trying to determine how much calcium coordinate or how much shells I had in this sample of beach sand. How do I do that? Well, the first thing is I need to weigh this, the mixture and then I need to separate them somehow and weigh one of them then I can get the other for example. So what we can do is I can have my calcium carbonate mixture with the sand so I have the sand and the calcium carbonate. Now if I put both of them into dilute hydrochloric acid which one will dissolve if I put both into the hydrochloric acid, the uh, calcium carbonate will dissolve, the sand will not. And that means that then I can filter it, the sand will remain in the filter paper. Okay, but he's asking about finding out the percentage of shell. So the, sh the shell is what dissolved. How am I going to know how much dissolved? Well, I should weigh the mixture at the beginning. And then at the end, weigh how much sand I got, and the subtraction of the bo of both will give me how much shells I had. Are you following? The shells dissolve in the hydrochloric acid. The sand does not. So you're going to filter. 
the sand remains in the funnel. Now I can weigh how much sand I had and I should have a mass of the original mixture. If I subtract them from each other, then I get the mass of the shells, right? So this is how you explain this. When you explain this kind of investigation, it is very important to explain in detail. Tell him what kind of apparatus you are using in each step and write it in the correct order. So what are we supposed to do first? We're supposed to weigh the mixture first. So specify something, something like 10 grams of beach sand. It could be five grams, for example. Usually we're not going to use a very small amount, but whatever amount you decide, that's fine. Now, let's say weigh 10 grams of the beach sand using what? Using a balance. And then what am I going to do with this mixture? I'm going to put it into a beaker and add excess dilute hydrochloric acid there with a glass of, or do it as the picture. The picture is doing actually the opposite. They put the acid in the beaker and then they're adding the uh, salt to it or the mixture to it. So I'm explaining the other way. It doesn't make a difference, okay? And then we say, uh, calcium, when we do the mixture in the hydrochloric acid, when we dissolve the mixture in the hydrochloric acid, which one of them dissolves? The calcium carbonate, which is the shells. So the calcium carbonate or the shells dissolve. And this is carbonate with acid that will dissolve and give out a gas. That's okay. And then after that, you want to separate the sand because the sand did not dissolve. So what do? how do we separate it? Filter through, filter, paper and funnel. Now, what is collected as residue? It's the sand. Now, I want to weigh this. I cannot weigh it without drying, so I have to dry the sand. We said, how do we dry the residue? We can dry any solid in, the, in chemistry between filter papers. You always say dry the residue or dry the solid between filter papers. You, you put it in the middle and you put filter papers. The filter papers soak up the water. And then I weigh the sand. And if I subtract, this is the mass of the sand, but he doesn't want the mass of the sand. He wants the shell material. So I subtract it from the original mass and get the mass of the shell material. And then I can calculate percentage. If you want to go on and tell him exactly how he's going to calculate percentage, that's good. Okay. Okay. So this is another method of separation of mixtures. This is called crystallization. Now, when do I use crystallization? I use crystallization if I'm trying to get something that was soluble from its solution. So, for example, I have aqueous sodium chloride. Remember again that the word aqueous means dissolved in water. So, when I say aqueous sodium chloride, that means I have a solution of sodium chloride dissolved in water. Now, which one do I want? Do I want the water or do I want the salt? I want the salt, then I do crystallization. How do we do crystallization? We put the mixture in an evaporating dish and we heat using a Bunsen burner. Now, I keep heating. Why am I heating? I'm heating in order to remove as much of the water as possible. So what I'm doing is I'm trying to concentrate this solution. Now, how do I know if I've heated it enough? I want to heat it to what we call point of crystallization. Point of crystallization means that I heat it just to remove enough water so that when I cool it, it starts to form crystals. How do I know that I have reached point of crystallization? When I put a glass rod into the solution and remove it, crystals will form on the tip. So I put my solution in an evaporating dish. I heat it. Most of the water will evaporate. The solution starts to boil and the water evaporates. So my solution becomes what we call a concentrate solution or what we call a saturated solution. Now, when I insert the glass rod and remove it and it shows crystals on the tip, I know that I have heated it enough. Now I stop heating, I cool the solution. When this kind of solution cools, it starts to form crystals. You start to see a solid coming out, crystals coming out. So now you want these crystals. How do you get the crystals? We said now I have crystals solid in a solution. I filter through filter paper and funnel. If he says I want to dry, then dry the crystals between filter papers. Are we okay with this? When do we do this? If I have a solution, something dissolved in something, and I want the salt that is dissolved. So we do crystallization. So I tell him 
heat to point of crystallization, cool, filter through filter paper and funnel, dry the crystals between filter papers. And we said, how do I know if I have heated it enough? How do I know if I have heated it to point of crystallization? We said, insert the glass rod into the hot solution and remove it. Crystals should form on the tip. Now, once you have heated it enough, or once you have heated it to point of crystallization, the solution that is formed is called a saturated solution. The definition of saturated solution is a solution in which no more solid can dissolve at a certain temperature. So this is a solution that has a lot of solid dissolved in a very small amount of water so that as soon as I leave it to cool, it starts to form crystals. So it is called a saturated solution. Okay, so this is a typical question regarding what we're talking about. So let's take a look, look at it. Rock salt is a mixture of salt and sand. So when sand, sand and salt are mixed, they call it rock salt. Crystals of pure salt can be obtained from rock salt by using the method. So now he has salt and sand, <coughs> and he wants the salt. So what should he do? When you have a mixture of two things, one of them dissolves in, let's say, water here. The other does not dissolve. Then you should add this, the water dissolve the salt, filter, and get the sand, right? So this is what we're trying to do. The first thing he says, grind the rock salt into a fine powder, okay? If he says, why am I doing this? We're doing this to dissolve easily, for the uh, substances to dissolve easily. Then he says, add this powder to hot water and stare to what? Stare to dissolve the salt. Again, I have a mixture of two things. One dissolves in a certain solvent, the other does not. How do I separate them? I add the solvent. So in this case, I have salt and sand. Salt dissolves in water, sand does not. So I add water. Why am I adding water? So that the salt will dissolve. Now I'm left with the sand standing there in the beaker. I do what? I filter the crystal. The salt solution passes through the filter paper leaving behind the sand, so the sand remains in the filter paper. Now, what does he want? He wants the salt. The salt is now a solution in the flask. So, boil the filtrate to evaporate some of the water. And then I do, what am I doing now? I'm doing crystallization. I have a solution of salt and I want to get the salt. So, I heat it to evaporate some of the water. And then I leave the saturated solution to cool so that crystals of the salt form. And then finally, what should I do? Filter the mixture to separate the crystals from the remaining solution. Okay, this is what we do if we're trying to separate any two substances, two solids. One of them dissolves, the other does not. Then you add whatever it dissolves in. So if he says it dissolves in benzene, for example, then you say add benzene, uh, stare, so whatever is supposed to dissolve will dissolve and I'm left with the insoluble one. I filter to get the insoluble one in the um, filter paper. And then I take the solution that is the filtrate in the flask, heat it to point of crystallization, cool, filter the crystals in order to obtain crystals of the salt. Do we understand this? So this is a typical question. A student is given a mixture of barium sulfate, copper sulfate, and water. The table shows information about barium sulfate and copper sulfate. So he's telling me that when I use water, barium sulfate doesn't dissolve, copper sulfate will dissolve. The state at room temperature is both of them are solids. So if I have both of them in a beaker, then I have two solids mixed together. So how does the student obtain copper sulfate crystals from this mixture? So if I have a mixture of the two solids and I'm trying to separate them. We said that one of them dissolves in water, the other does not. So I can add water, okay? And then when I add water, what happens? The copper sulfate will dissolve, the barium sulfate does not. So what am I supposed to do after that? I'm supposed to filter to get rid of the one that is not soluble and then I do crystallization. So actually my answer is D. Are you following? This is how we separate any two substances that are solids from each other when one of them is soluble in something and the other is not. So 
the, I add the, so, the solvent, so I add water, I stir. In this case, my copper sulfate will dissolve. The barium sulfate will remain as a solid. So how do I separate it? I separate it by filtration. Once I filter it, what remains in the filter paper? The barium sulfate will remain in the filter paper and the copper sulfate will be a solution in the flask. So I take this solution, I heat to point of crystallization. So that means I'm doing filtration and then crystallization. Okay, this is another investigation and experiment in paper six that he says you should try. So he says, ethane dioic acid dihydrate Please don't sit down and say, what is this? We haven't studied. It doesn't matter. It's just a white crystalline solid. So basically, he's saying this is a solid. This acid is water soluble and is found in rhubarb leaves. So this is something that dissolves in water. That's all we care about. It's a solid that dissolves in water. Plan an investigation to obtain crystals of this acid from some leaves. So you're starting with the leaves and you're trying to get crystals of this substance that is present in the leaves. You are provided with common laboratory apparatus, water, and sand. Now, if he gives you something, then you, a list of things, then you need to use them. So when I'm explaining, I need to include the water and the sand and specify the laboratory apparatus that you like. Okay, let's think about what are we supposed to do. He's giving me leaves and he's saying, these leaves contain a substance called ethane diuric acid, dihydrate. Okay? And he says he wants crystals of this substance. What should I do? Well, the leaves, you need to extract the solid from them. So, these leaves, I need to crush them. That's the first thing. And then add whatever substance I, it, the acid dissolves in. What does he say the acid dissolves in? It dissolves in water. So I'm supposed to crush these leaves and then add water so that the substance dissolves in the water, right? Okay. How do we crush a substance? First of all, I put it in this apparatus. What was the name of this apparatus? Mortar and pestle. And to crush anything, it is a good idea to add sand to it. Have you tried crushing leaves before? If you crush leaves alone, they form a slimy something mixture that's not easy to work with but if you put sand the sand gives it more texture so it makes it easier for you to um, gr to grind it or to uh, crush it so the first thing that we need to explain is that i'm going to crush the leaves using mortar and pestle um, after adding some sand so i'm going to put the leaves and the sand in the mortar and pestle crush it now i have the crushed substance then what then I want to dissolve the acid in something. What did he say uh, it dissolves in? It dissolves in water, so that means I need to add water to the crushed mixture. And then I need to separate the leaves and sand from the solution because the ethane diuric acid will dissolve in the water. Now I need to separate all of this, so we need filtration, right? So, after adding water to this mixture of leaves and sand and so on, I pour it through the filter paper. What will remain as a residue in the filter paper? The leaves and the sand will all remain as a residue. And what comes down will be the solution of the ethane dioic acid dissolved in water, right? That will be my filtrate. Okay, now he wants crystals from this filtrate. And we said to make to get crystals from a solution, what do we do? We said the crystals, okay, that is the solution that we're going to get. And I want to make crystals out of it. So I need to do what? I need to heat it to point of crystallization, uh, cool to form crystals, uh, filter the crystals, and dry the crystals between filter paper. Okay, so this is what we're supposed to explain. So the first thing we said, crush the leaves with some sand in a mortar and pestle. So that's what you use the sand for. Put into a beaker, add water and stir. Now, if I add water and stir, the ethane diuric acid in the leaves will dissolve and uh, it will leave the rest of the leaves and the sand. Stir with a glass rod. Filter through filter paper and funnel. This is to get rid of the remains of the leaves and sand. And I need the solution, the filtrate. Heat the filtrate to point of crystallization, cool, 
filter request. Okay. This is another investigation or experiment that he wants you to do. He says copper oxide and carbon are both black solids. So if I put them both into a beaker, I have a mixture of two black solids. And he's saying that the copper oxide will react with the anisophoric acid to form aqueous copper sulfate. If it forms aqueous copper sulfate, that means that it dissolves in the copper sulfate. So he's saying that the copper oxide dissolves in what? In dilute sulfuric acid. Okay? It dissolves, sorry, in the dilute sulfuric acid. So the copper oxide will dissolve in the dilute uh, sulfuric acid. The carbon does not react with the dilute sulfuric acid. And that means if I have the mixture of solids in a beaker, I want to separate them, then I should add what to separate them? I should add the sulfuric acid because he says the copper oxide reacts with the sulfuric acid, but the carbon does not. You are given a mixture of copper to oxide and carbon and access to dilute sulfuric acid. Plan an experiment to investigate the percentage of copper oxide. Once he says percentage, so he's not just saying separate them. No, he wants a measurement of how much I had in the mixture. That means that I have to weigh the mixture at the beginning and weigh whatever I get at the end, and then I can compare them and get the percentage, right? So, first of all, what basically what we have is a beaker containing copper oxide and carbon. So what's the first thing that I should do? I should weigh a specific amount of this mixture. Of course, we weigh using a balance. Then put the mixture into a beaker. Can you see how I'm explaining it? In detail, one by one. I always say, when you are explaining these kinds of questions, please imagine that you are talking to someone who has no idea what's going on. So you're telling him one by one, you have someone with you in the lab, you, he has no idea about chemistry, and you're trying to explain to him how to do the experiment. So you have to tell him in detail, one by one, what he should use, what he should do in, in the correct order, and so on, okay? So you're telling him, weigh 10 grams of the mixture using a balance, and then put this mixture into a beaker because you need to add to it the acid. So in order to add to it to acid, you need to put it into a beaker. And then add the excess sulfuric acid and you need one of them to dissolve. So you need to stir and we said stir with a glass rod. Now, which one dissolves? We said the copper oxide will dissolve, the carbon will not. So one of them has dissolved into solution and the carbon has remained as a solid. Now you need to filter through filter paper and funnel. So you will get what as residue? The one that does not dissolve. So you will actually get the carbon in the filter paper. Now, you can wash the residue with the few drops of distilled water, dry the residue between filter paper, and weigh using a balance. But this is the mass of what? This is the mass of the carbon. He doesn't want the carbon. He wants the what? The copper oxide. But if I subtract the mass of the carbon from the mass of the mixture that I weighed at the beginning, then I can get the mass of copper oxide. So subtract from the original mass, Calculate the percentage. Do you know how to calculate percentage? It will be the mass of copper oxide over the total, the original 10 grams times 100. So if you want to include that in the answer, that's fine. Okay, this is another experiment. Potassium chloride is a salt that dissolves in water. Right? Okay, sorry. Potassium chloride is a salt that dissolves in water. The solubility of a salt is the mass in grams of the salt that dissolves in 100 centimeter cubed of water. Plan an investigation to do what? Plan an investigation to determine the solubility of potassium chloride in water at 40 degrees centigrade. And he's telling me that solubility means, basically, I'm trying to find out how much of the salt dissolved in 100 centimeter cubed of water. So you want to know how much of the salt can dissolve in a specific amount of water. So first of all, you put that amount, put 100 centimeter cubed of water in a beaker using a magic cylinder. He wants the solubility at 40. So you need to heat this water to 40 degrees centigrade in order to uh, determine it at this temperature. Now, how do I know how much salt dissolves? I don't know how much salt is going to dissolve. So I need to weigh a lot of the salt at the beginning. So let's say I weigh 100 grams of potassium chloride using a balance. 
And then I add a little bit by little bit and dissolve until it stops dissolving. So you add to the water and stir until solid remains. Okay, so you put all the 100 grams in the water by and stir it so that whatever dissolves will dissolve and the rest of the 100 grams will remain where? It will remain in the beaker. So now I can filter through filter paper and funnel, dry the residue. What would be the residue in this case? The residue will be the rest of the 100 grams that did not dissolve in the water, right? The residue is the solid that did not dissolve. So when you put the 100 grams of the potassium chloride into the water, whatever dissolves will dissolve and you're left with some solid. So you get that as a residue. You dry between filter paper, you weigh. If you subtract that from the original mass, so what if I say at, at the end I found what? I ended up with 70 grams of potassium chloride that did not dissolve. Then the subtraction, 100 minus 70, that was the what actually dissolved. So you will know now the mass of the uh, solid that actually dissolved in the water. Okay? Now, Another method of separation is simple distillation. Now, when do I use simple distillation? I use simple distillation if I'm starting with a solution, for example, water and something dissolved in it, and I want what? I want the water. Remember that when I had a solution and I wanted the salt, I did crystallization. Now I have the solution, but I want what? I want the pure water. Then I do simple distillation. So in distillation, I put it into this round bottomed flask with a thermometer in it attached to a condenser. I heat the solution in the flask. Now the temperature will start to rise in the thermometer until it reaches the boiling point. The solution will start to boil. The uh, solvent will evaporate. So in this case, the water will boil and evaporate and it will collect in the condenser. The condenser is, as we said before, is something made up of two tubes inside each other. There is a tube through which the water vapor will go. But there is also an outer jacket that you're going to pass cold water through. And in this case, it's very important that the cold water goes in the opposite direction to the direction that is being used by the water vapor. So the water vapor is going down from left to right, then the water should go up from right to left so that the cooling will be efficient. Because if we don't do that, then part of the condenser will not have enough water and uh, the cooling will not be efficient. So basically the cold water goes from down to up in the condenser. Why are we doing this? For more efficient cooling so that the condenser is filled with water okay we need the water to cool the water vapor the water vapor changes into water and collects in the conical flask this is called simple distillation so again when do we use simple distillation if i have a solution and i want the water aqueous sodium chloride and i want water from aqueous sodium chloride for example then i do distillation if i have a mixture of two liquids so I don't just have water, I have water and something else. Water and ethanol, for example. Then I do fractional distillation. Can you see the difference between this and the previous uh, diagram? The only difference is the fractionating column. Can you see what's the fractionating column? The fractionating column is that extra piece on the flask. It, is, it contains inside it little pieces of glass, which we call glass beads. Or it could be glass columns inside. So it's just pieces of glass or a, col a column of glass. This uh, hinders the, the vapors from going up very quickly. And what is happening is, what I put in my original flask is a mixture of two liquids. So fractional distillation, I must have a mixture of two or more liquids. How do I separate them? I separate them based on the difference in boiling point. So they have to be two liquids with a different what? With a different boiling point. So, for example, I could have water and ethanol. Now, ethanol has a lower boiling point than water. Ethanol will boil at about 78 degrees centigrade. 
So if I have a mixture in the flask, ethanol and water, and I'm heating, the temperature in the thermometer will start to rise. 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70. At 78, the ethanol boils. The water hasn't reached its boiling point yet. So the water is not boiling, but the water evaporates. Remember that we said evaporation happens at any temperature. So all through the rise in temperature, the water is evap evaporating. So what goes up into the fractionating column is the ethanol vapor and some water vapor. But the ethanol is at its boiling point. So it will boil and continue to go up the fractionating column and go into the condenser be cooled and be collected into the beaker. Any water vapor that goes up with it will be hindered by the fractionating column. It will not be able to go through the fractionating column because it's not really boiling. This is not its uh, boiling temperature. So once it goes into the fractionating column, it will cool and come back again. Do you understand that? So any water vapor that goes up at this temperature will be cooled in the fractionating column, form droplets of water that will go back again. And the temperature in the thermometer, remember when we were doing heating curves, we said the temperature in the thermometer, so long as something is boiling, the temperature remains constant. So, so long as the ethanol is boiling, the temperature in the thermometer remains at 78 degrees centigrade. The ethanol goes through the condenser, is cooled, collected in the beaker. One, how do I know if all the ethanol has evaporated? If all the ethanol has been collected, then the temperature in the thermometer will start to rise. So once I see that the temperature starts to rise, I remove that beaker that contains ethanol. I put a new beaker because the ethanol was one fraction and now I'm collecting another fraction. So a fraction means a group of liquids that were collected at similar boiling points. So I collected the liquid that came out at 78 degrees centigrade. That is one fraction. I remove the beaker, I put a new beaker, and then the temperature starts to rise, 78, 80, 90, 100. Once it reaches 100, the water in the flask will start to boil. The temperature remains at 100. The water boils very quickly, so it go, the water vapor goes through the fractionating column, is condensed in the condenser. Remember, if I say what is the function of the condenser, the condenser does what? Uh, cools and condenses the vapor. It cools and condenses the vapor. And then the water will come out as droplets, col be collected in the new beaker, and the temperature will remain at 100. Do we understand what's happening? So we are separating the two liquids based on difference in boiling point. How do I know when one fraction has been collected if the thermometer the temperature in the thermometer starts to rise again. So long as it is stable, I'm collecting a specific fraction. Okay, so let's take a look at this question. A teacher separated a mixture of two liquids using the apparatus shown. The liquids were ethanoic acid, and he's telling you, you're not required to sit down and know the boiling point of any of these things, except water, of course. We know the boiling point of water. Ethanoic acid boils at 118. Chloroethanoic acid boils at 100. 90. So they have different boiling points. That means they can be separated by this method. So first of all, complete the boxes to label the pieces of apparatus. So what is that apparatus at the top of the fractionating column? Of course, that is a thermometer. And what is the name of that other apparatus? A condenser. Okay. Which liquid will be collected first? Let's go back. He's saying ethanoic boils at a lower temperature than chloroethanoic acid. The one that boils at the lower temperature is the one that is collected first. So ethanoic boils at 118, the other one boils at 190. Then the liquid that is collected first is ethanoic since it has lower boiling point. How would the teacher know when all of this liquid has been collected? We said when all this liquid, a certain liquid has been collected, then the temperature will start to rise. So just why small beads are used in fractionating column instead of large glass beads. This has to do with the surface area. So if I use something that has small pieces, we said small pieces have larger surface area. So that will help 
uh, to prevent any bumping. Okay. So techniques used in the separation of mixtures include crystallization, filtration, fractional distillation, simple distillation. Each letter may be used once, more than once, or not at all. Remember that for all of these choices in most of the questions, don't say that I have used this once, I don't need to use it again. No. Usually, each letter may be used once, more than once, or not at all, unless if he specifies that you're supposed to use it only once. So, what is he trying to separate? He's trying to separate pure water from seawater. So he has sea water. You should know that sea water is actually a mixture of what? Of water and salt. So he has a mixture of water and salt and he wants which one? Does he want the salt or does he want the water? He wants the water. If I want the liquid from the solution, then I do simple distillation. If he wanted the salt, I would have said crystallization, right? So he wants pure water, so that is simple distillation. Ethanol, if I want ethanol from a mixture of ethanol and water. So ethanol and water are both liquids. So I want to separate a mixture of liquids. We said to separate a mixture of liquids, I need fractional distillation. Um, calcium carbonate or a mixture of calcium carbonate and water. Now I will tell you if you don't know that calcium carbonate does not dissolve in water. So this is a water with something that does not dissolve in it an insoluble substance. How do I get the calcium carbonate? By filtration. Now, this is copper sulfate 5 water solid. That means crystals. You want crystals of the copper sulfate from an aqueous solution of copper sulfate. So that means that I have a solution and I want what? I want the crystals or I want the solid. So how do I do that? By crystallization. Okay. Which method separates a mixture of sugar and glass? Sugar and glass. If I have a mixture of sugar and glass, what should I do? Sugar is something that dissolves in water. Glass does not. So what I should do is I should add water. The sugar will dissolve. And then I filter. The glass will remain in my um, filter paper as a residue. And the sugar solution is in the uh, flask so I can evaporate it to get the solution or do crystallization. So my answer should be A. Which method should be used to separate a mixture of two liquids? Again, to separate a mixture of two liquids, I need fractional distillation. Okay, the last thing that method, method of separation that we're talking about is paper chromatography. Now, paper chromatography can be used for one of two things. Either I have a sample, so I have something, a solution, and I want to know how many components in this solution, or I want to know how many colors in it. For example, I could have ink, blue ink. I want to know how many colors are in ink, in this sample of ink, because ink, when it is blue, it's actually, or black or whatever, it's actually a mixture of colors together. So, what I will do is I will get a piece of filter paper or chromatography paper. Chromatography paper is basically a filter paper that I can cut in uh, a rectangle, in the form of a rectangle. So I get a filter paper or what we call chromatography paper, cut it in the form of a rectangle. I draw a baseline. Can you see the line near the bottom of the filter paper? This is called a baseline. And I need to draw it in pencil because pencil is something that has graphite in it and graphite does not dissolve in any solvent. So it will not affect my experiment. I don't want something that will dissolve in my solvent. If I use ink, if I draw that baseline that is drawn near the bottom of the uh, filter paper, if I draw it in ink, the ink will dissolve and spoil the experiment and interfere and things like that. So basically you have to draw a line in pencil near the bottom of the rectangular filter paper. And then I put a spot of my sample. So I put a spot, a tiny spot of my ink that I'm trying to analyze. And then I take the chromatography paper and put it into a beaker containing a very small amount of a specific solvent so that, first of all, the level of the solvent does not reach my spot. Can you see that the level of the solvent 
touches the edge of the paper but it does not reach my spot i don't want my spot to dissolve into the beaker and the whole thing becomes colored and things like that so this is to avoid dissolving the spot or the sample in the solvent now the next thing would be which solvent should i use if we're talking about ink or we're talking about any food coloring then my solvent is water and you should specify so if he's saying separate the colors in ink or separate the colors in some food coloring then we use water anything else we usually use ethanol or if he's saying for example that the sample does not dissolve in water then i will tell him that the solvent is ethanol okay so once i leave this into the uh, in the solvent the solvent starts to soak up the chromatography paper the solvent will move up the chromatography paper and as it moves up you'll start to see the spots separating now why are they separating the spots are separating because these are different compounds and they have different solubilities in the solvent so something that is very very soluble in the solvent will go up very quickly to the top so that green spot there is more soluble in the solvent the one that is less soluble in the solvent will go up slowly so they will start to separate so if we say why are they separating they're separating due to differences in solubility in the solvent and then um, if a spot does not go up at all it remains on the baseline if a spot remains on the baseline and we say why does it remain on the baseline that means that this spot or this uh, compound is not soluble in the solvent or is insoluble in the solvent so in this case i have used my paper chromatography to separate the components of my sample determine how many colors i have obviously this sample that i used had two colors so that means that it had two components in it or two different dyes in it okay but i could also use chromatography to determine which substance do i have for example in this case i have a sample which i call a and i want to know does a contain compound number one or compound number two or compound number three what i do is i get my chromatography paper i draw the baseline and i put the spots of the sample and the spots of the known substances next to each other on the baseline so a spot of a, a spot of one a spot of two a spot of three and i put this again into a beaker containing a small amount of the solvent specify which solvent we're talking about dyes for example or inks or food coloring then i say in a beaker containing a small amount of water i allow the water to move up the chromatography paper now you have to know that substances when they are the same they move up the same height so substance a and substance one they both went up the same height that means that they're the same that means that a is one or a contains compound one it doesn't contain compound two because it doesn't have a spot the same height as two it doesn't contain three because it doesn't have a spot the same height as three do we understand that okay another method of determining which substance i have is to determine its rf value now the rf value of any spot is the distance traveled by the spot divided by the distance traveled by the solvent remember that that line at the top is the line to which the solvent reached before i removed the chromatography paper so it's called the solvent front so if i want to determine the rf value of something let's say i want to determine the rf value of compound three then i get a ruler I measure the distance from the baseline to the middle of spot 3. You understand that red spot? The distance from the baseline to the middle of that red spot. And then the distance from the baseline also to the solvent front, to the place where the solvent went up. Divide them, distance traveled by spot divided by distance traveled by solvent. That value is called an RF value. The RF value is something that is unique to any substance. So I can tell you that. A certain substance has RF value, so and so. Now you tell me, does my sample have this substance or not? Well, does my sample have a spot the same RF value? Then I have the same substance. Do we understand that? So 
For example, a student produces this chromatogram for four dyes A, B, C, and D. Which one of the dyes contains three colors? Of course, if it contains three colors, that means it gave me three spots. Remember that each spot goes up horizontally. If it gives three spots, then it has three colors. So which one gave me three spots? Can you see that compound D is the one that gave me three spots? Okay, which one of the dyes contains one color only? If it has one color only, that means it gave me only one uh, spot. So A, B, C, D, which one has one spot? Because we're talking about the dyes A, B, C, D. So A, B, C, D, which one had one spot? A, so that means it contains only one color. Amino acids are colorless and can be separated and identified by chromatography. Yes, that's something that I forgot to mention. If we're talking about amino acids or about sugars, both amino acids are sh and sugars are substances that don't have a color. So I'm not going to see any spot visible on the paper. When I do this, when I remove the paper, after removing the paper, I can't see any spots. I need to spray the paper with a compound that will react with the substances and give it color. This compound is called, uh, this substance is called locating agent. A locating agent is a substance that I can spray on my chromatography paper to cause the colorless spots to become colored so that they are visible. So this is to give the spots color to make them visible. That's a locating agent. So amino acids are colorless. So that means that if I do chromatography, I need, after doing the chromatography, to spray the paper with a locating agent in order to determine the places of the spots or to give the spots color to make it visible. Okay, so if I'm doing amino acids, I will need a locating agent. What else do I need? If I'm trying to get the RF value, I will need a ruler. So actually, when you're working with amino acids or sugars, you will need a ruler to determine the RF value because we said, how do we get RF value? Distance traveled by the spot divided by distance traveled. So this is you are using a ruler. And I need a locating agent because the spots are colorless. So I need something to give it color to make it visible. Okay, this is another typical question. A sample of a green food coloring was separated into its components, uh, component colors using paper chromatography. The results obtained are shown. What is the RF value of the blue spot? So if he asks that, what should, what should you do? Get a ruler, measure the distance from the baseline to the blue spot, to the middle of the spot. And then measure the distance from the baseline to the solvent front. The distance of the blue spot divided by the distance of the solvent front, that is your RF value. If you do this, so you're measuring the distance of the from the baseline to the blue spot and the distance of the baseline to the solvent front. Divide them over each other. In this case, you will find that the RF value is 0.45. Okay, so chromatography is done on a mixture. This is another question containing a drug. The drug has an RF value of 0.66. The diagram is not drawn to scale. Which spot on the chromatogram represents the drug? He already measured it and gave you the measurements. So he wants which one has an RF value of 0.66. What should you do? So you should divide the distance traveled by the spot, whether it's 0.66 or 9.9 .9 or 12, divided by the distance traveled by the solvent front. So for example, the RF value of A is 12 divided by 15. The RF value of B is 9.9 .9 divided by 15. The RF value of C is 0.66 divided by 15. What is the RF value of D? D didn't move at all, so its RF value is 0. So whatever comes out to be 0.66, that's your correct answer, and actually it will be spot B. Okay, another question, we're almost finished. The diagram shows the chromatogram obtained when four samples of amino acids were analyzed. The paper was sprayed with ninhydrin. Obviously, you don't need to know what exactly ninhydrin is, but obviously, since he used it to spray the paper, that must mean that the ninhydrin is some type of locating agent. We're, we're talking about amino acids. We said amino acids are not colored. So once I finish the chromatography, I should spray the paper with a locating agent to give it 
to give the spots color to make it visible. Okay, which amino acids could possibly be the same? We said substances are the same if the spots go up the same height or if they have the same RF value, that's the same thing. So, which ones has spots going up the same height? 1 and 3. Can you see the spot for 1 and the spot for 3? They are both on the same level. Which amino acid samples contains more than one amino acid? Explain your answer. So, which one has more than one? If you see substance 1, give me one spot. Substance 2, give me one spot. Substance 3, give me one. But substance 4 gave four spots. Can you see that? So, sample uh, 4 is, uh, sorry, sample 4 gave two spots. So, sample 4 has two spots and that is, that means that it has two compounds. Okay, another typical question, a chromatography experiment was done to separate a mixture of four substances. The RF values measured for these substances were 0 0.3, 0 0.5, 0 0.8, and 0.8. Which diagram shows the chromatogram obtained? Remember that if we are doing chromatography of a certain substance, all the spots that are formed are on the same horizontal, uh, vertical line, on the same line going up on the same vertical line okay so if something has the same rf value are you going to see it like b or like d no they are both on the same on the same rf value so they will actually appear as one spot so actually your answer is c because he says i have two substances that have the same rf value if they have the same rf value they will appear exactly together on the same spot on the same vertical line from the sample okay so my answer is C. a student used paper chromatography to separate a mixture of colored dyes the diagram shows the apparatus used draw a line on the diagram to show the level of the solvent so we said this paper is in a beaker and the beaker contains the solvent and we said the solvent has to be what it has to be touching the edge the lower edge of the paper but it shouldn't be reaching the spot of the mixture of colored dyes. So uh, my line should be like this. Can you see that? It should be touching the paper, but not reaching the spot of my sample on the baseline. So just a suitable solvent. Well, we go back. What is he using? A student used paper compound to separate a mixture of what? Dyes. Dyes is ink. Ink, you use water. If you say ethanol in this case, because he does not specify uh, anything, so you can also say ethanol. But we, remember, if we say dyes or ink or uh, food colorings, we usually use water. What could be used to put the mixture of colored dyes onto the paper? We said I need a drop of the mixture on the baseline. So if I need to put, you, uh, to put a drop, I use a drop. The clips hold the paper in position. Why is this important for the chromatography experiment? Remember that you need to keep the paper in a specific place to keep the mixture above the solvent. I don't want the paper, if you don't hang it like this, the paper will go down into the beaker and the mixture will dissolve in all the solvent that is in the beaker. So this is to keep the mixture above the solvent. The diagram shows another question again. We're almost finished. Diagram shows the chromatogram obtained from four dyes, A, B, C, and D. Give one conclusion that can be drawn about dye B. Where is dye B? Can you see? Dye B has how many spots? It has two spots, so that means it has two substances. It also has one spot the same height as D. Can you see that? So another answer, another possible answer would be the fact that it contains substance D. So you can either say it contains substance D, that is because it has a spot the same height as D, or it contains two substances, that is because when it went up, it gave me two spots. So just why dye C remained on the baseline? We said if something remains on the baseline, what does that mean? If it remains on the baseline, that means that that compound is insoluble in the solvent that we used. RF values are used to identify compounds. And he gives you that RF is the distance traveled by the compound divided by the distance traveled by the solvent. So he says, calculate the RF value of dye A. Where is dye A? Well, I need to 
uh, calculate the distance from the baseline to the middle of spot A divided by the distance of the, from the baseline to the solvent front. If you do that, it comes out to be 0.6. Another question, chromatography and fractional distillation can be used to separate compounds. In which type of separation is a thermometer needed? Where do we need a thermometer? Chromatography? No, we never said we're going to use thermometer in chromatography, so A and B is wrong. Fractional distillation? Yes, we should use a thermometer at the top of the flask in at the top of the fractionating column in the fractional distillation. But then we have two choices. Is it fractional distillation of colorless liquids or fractional distillation of liquids that have colors? Well, if they have different colors, I can see them evaporating. So I can see which one is evaporating. So I, I don't really need a thermometer to show me that one of them is being com is coming out and then the other one is coming out. But if I'm doing fractional distillation of two colorless liquids, I must use a thermometer to determine whether the first liquid has finished collecting or not, right? Okay, this is an investigation. One of the questions that are at the end of paper six, usually these questions are for six marks, seven marks, five marks, so it's a lot of marks, okay? So try and practice doing them. This one says an orange drink may contain artificial colors, which he calls E110 and E129. And he said E110 is something that's yellow in color, E129 is red. Plan an investigation to determine the presence of these colors in a sample of orange drink. So this is a sample of drink that has colors. And I want to know, does it have E110 uh, or E129 or both and so on. So in order to do that, I first of all, I'm supposed to explain chromatography. So I need to put, get a chromatography paper. What I'm going to explain is usually it's a good idea to draw it and then explain. So because when you draw it, then um, you get an idea of what you're going to do first. First of all, these questions at the end of paper six, it's always a good idea to draw, even if he doesn't tell you to draw. Sometimes he says you have to draw. But usually, even if he doesn't tell you to draw, he gives you enough space in order to draw because when you draw, this gives a good idea of whether you understand the experiment or not. Okay, so what are we going to do? We've decided that we're trying to separate drinks to find out their colors. So what we're explaining is chromatography. So how do we do chromatography? Get a chromatography paper, draw a baseline. Now I need to know if my drink contains something, then I put a spot of the drink next to a spot of E110 and a spot of E129. And I put it into a beaker containing which solvent again, where we're talking about food colorings or, or, or drinks that are colored, then my uh, solvent should be water. Draw the diagram to show that the chromatography paper is placed into the beaker containing water so that the water does not reach the samples. Allow the water to move up the paper and determine the one that has the same height is present. So, for example, in this drink, which one is present, E110 or E129? Well, the one that has the same height as the drink. So, obviously, this drink contains E110 but not E129, for example. So how do you explain all of this? This is how you explain all of this. In detail, one by one, in the correct order. Put a spot of the orange drink next to a spot of E110 and E129 on a baseline near the bottom of a rectangular filter paper or chromatography paper. Put the paper into a beaker containing a very small amount of water below the baseline. Allow the water to move up the paper. If the orange drink has spots now, at the end of the experiment, you have to tell me how do I know if something happens or, or how do I know if, if um, to get the answer that he wants. But you don't need to tell him what answer you should get. So here you t you're going to tell him, how do I know if the orange drink contains these, if the orange drink has spots the same height as the colorings, they are present. Okay? Okay, so this is the end of the chapter. And... Hopefully, you will go back, study it very well, uh, go over the video as many times as you like, uh, check your PDF chapterized questions, and sit down and do the questions. And then we'll see the answers next time. Okay?
Thank you for listening.